So now I'd like to introduce our presenter, Cynthia Carney. Cindy is a founding member of Kayak and the executive director of Goodwin House Palliative Care and Hospice. She's an RN and has been working in hospice for 20 years. The Coalition to Improve Advanced Care, or Kayak, is a collaborative effort of nonprofit and community organizations in Arlington County and surrounding areas. Kayak's mission is to improve the quality of life both for those facing advanced illness and for their caregivers. Now I am going to turn it over to Cindy. Well, thank you very much for joining me this morning. I must tell you that um, you're really getting a head start on understanding what is available for you if you or a loved one has a terminal illness. Um, many people that we work with have no idea what hospice or palliative care is once they are ready for it. And there's a lot of fear associated there's a lot of emotions associated with what you're going through. And so having a working knowledge of what this is all about before it happens to you is, is so helpful. It's sort of like a cushion. It, it, helps to, um, it helps you with your, gives you a chance to be the person with your loved one and to deal with that instead of having to deal with all these new things that you're learning. So I really appreciate that you've joined us this morning and um, that you're willing to learn about this. I wanna say that I'm so sorry that I can't be with you in person. I so much enjoy doing this um, so that people can give me their insight about these issues. They can tell their personal stories because that's what we're all about. We're all about telling personal stories to one another. And so I'm sorry that's not happening in person, but I hope that you will join me by, um, you know, giving it by sharing with me any comments that you have and um, questions. I also wanted to just tell you a little bit about how I came into this field because a lot of people are like, who the heck does this? You know, how did you get started? Um, a lot of people will tell you in hospice that they always knew that they wanted to be a hospice nurse or a hospice employee, that this was something that they knew from the very beginning. I'm not one of those people, but I, once I started, I never stopped. Um, uh, my husband and I grew up in this area and we moved to Florida for about five years. And during that time, that's how I was introduced to hospice. I started out as an RN case manager, traveling around uh, rural Tampa and um, you know, working with people in their homes. And then I moved on to into administrative positions. So um, it's, it's, it's something I never thought I was going to do, but now I can't imagine me being without it. So I just wanted to share a little bit about myself and, and how important this has been um, to shape me as an individual and to make me who I am today. So let's get started. And again, please share with me any comments that you have, any stories, any questions. So hospice is a philosophy it's, it's not a place. A lot of people, when they talk about hospice, they think they're coming to a, a building. And we do have inpatient centers where you come to stay, but most of hospice in our country takes place in your home. That home can be a house, it can be an apartment, it can be in a facility, in an assisted living, a nursing home, um, in Tampa, we had some homeless people. When I worked in DC, we had a shelter around the corner from our office and we had a couple of um, shelter people. So 
It's anywhere that you call home. And it's a comprehensive program of care. It's not just, oh, this is hospice, that's it. It's a, it's a whole philosophy in which a team of um, people who are trained in end of life care work together to bring the patient and their family as much quality of life until the very end. And that is so different for every single person. Again, it's a team approach to care. So we have social workers, nurses, doctors, aides, spiritual counselors, and volunteers who all bring um, a, a unified force to what we're providing to the hospice patient and his or her family. And again, you know, you some people ask me, well, if I'm in a nursing home and I'm getting 24 hour care, what, what is hospice gonna add to, to this care that I'm getting already? And what it, we're adding is that we are experts in how to deal with people who are facing end of life. That's not an expertise that every aide or every nurse in a nursing home or, or an assisted living has. We bring that piece to the um, to the care that you're providing, that you're being that you're receiving in a facility. So again, where does hospice take place? It takes anywhere the patient it takes place anywhere the patient calls home. And we're also a 24 hour service. So um, any hospice in the country is required to have an RN on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week with a physician or a nurse practitioner backing them up. Again, our interdisciplinary team consists of a medical director, physician, nurses, social workers, chaplains, or we like to call them spiritual counselors because there's so much more than just a chaplain. Although chaplains are not just, they're very important, but the spiritual counselor is important because they are trained to work as a counselor first, and secondly, as someone who can talk about anything that you want to talk about in terms of what's happening to you at this time in your life. We have certified nursing assistants and volunteers. What does hospice provide? Well, I'd like to say that hospice is the best kept secret in our country because the hospice Medicare benefit, which I'll talk about in a second, provides, and when I say provides, it pays for. All of your medical equipment that you need in your home, medications, medical supplies, and of course the interdisciplinary team. So when you sign on to hospice and if you have Medicare, um, Medicare, the Medicare hospice benefit will pay for all of this. And almost all insurance companies also have a hospice benefit associated. A lot of people, when they think about hospice, they think about cancer patients. And when hospice first started in the 1980s, there were a lot of um, cancer patients that came on to hospice until we began to realize that any end stage illness or condition can be uh, covered under the hospice benefit. Um, this includes um, patients who are getting weaker, losing weight, um, are losing their functional ability. And uh, in order to be eligible for the Medicare hospice benefit, every hospice team in this country has to document and show that their patients are meeting certain criteria that has been set by the federal government under the Medicare hospice benefit. I'm pausing be between slides in case you have any questions. So again, who is eligible for hospice? Anyone with a progressive life-limiting 
illness or condition. And this has to be certified um, by two physicians. One physician is the hospice medical director who looks over all of the um, medical documents associated with a particular patient. And the other is the attending physician who is a physician who knows the patient who has worked with that patient in the community. And um, so what we ask when we are meeting with the, the person who is interested in hospice, we ask them if they are interested in corporate care and not curative care. Because at this point, this benefit is intended for only those who do not want to pursue more curative treatment. And here are some other um, criteria that we look at when we're um, meeting with a family and trying to determine if they're eligible for hospice. Anyone with a serious progressive illness, weight loss, limited ability to perform um, their daily activities of life, multiple trips to the ER and frequent hospitalizations. The individual may be on continuous oxygen. The individual may have decreased cognitive ability and recurrent or intractable infections such as pneumonia, septus, and UTIs. And I'd like to, to add, since in the 20 years that I've been working with hospice, we now have more and more centenarians, centenarians who are um, coming onto hospice who have been healthy all their lives. And they're, some of them are not taking that many medications or no medication but they're simply getting older and unable to, um, I mean, they're, they're beginning to experience the effects of aging on their bodies. So that's another different category of people that we've been working with in the hospice. So we are, our team, our clinicians are trained in end of life care and they're trained to know what kinds of symptoms occurs to people who are toward the end of their life. They're trained to know what kinds of symptoms are associated with the different diagnoses. For instance, uh, symptoms for pancreatic cancer is gonna be different from symptoms from another type of cancer. And we are trained to know that. Um, we do use morphine. It is the gold standard of symptom relief in hospice. We use very, very minuscule doses and we monitor that very carefully. Uh, many people talk, you know, are concerned about addiction. And at this point in, in their lives, um, this is not a concern, especially since the morphine is only being used in very small doses. It is ordered by a physician and we carefully monitor and follow the physician orders. Um, we also carefully look at all the medications that the patient is taking so that we can make sure that first of all, they're not taking medications that they no longer need. And also that the medications they're using are effective. So here, I, I've already said hospice is the best kept healthcare secret in the country. Um, Medicare Part A covers 100% of the hospice benefit, and so does Medicaid. Most in commercial insurers and insurances provide the same benefits that the Medicare benefit covers. And um, most nonprofits will cover anybody regardless of whether they have resources. Another great advantage to hospice is that we just don't drop the family after the patient dies. We continue to care for them in whatever way that they're needed. From the very first day, the social worker is assessing 
what the bereavement needs are for the family and the caregivers. So for instance, if we had a 43 year old woman who had three children and a husband and a mother and a father, we would immediately start talking about, you know, or, and assessing what the needs of these, this family is because it's gonna be very different from someone who's 100 years old and they have an 85 year old son or daughter. Um, so for 13 months after the death of the patient, we are in touch with the family and we're sending them pamphlets, we're sending them, we're calling them to check in with them. And one of the really great things that we've started this year with the pandemic is that we are delivering bereavement bags to family homes in the area who live here um, that have small, to uh, not tokens, but small gifts in them that help with self-care. So for instance, a candle, a picture frame, things that can be used to help you remember your loved one and to cope with, with your grief. So who can make a referral to hospice? Anybody can. Anybody can call our hospice office and any hospice office in the country and ask about it, ask for an informational visit because you may not know that this is what you wanna do at this time. Um, you, you may have an informational visit with the hospice, hospice liaison and decide, you know, I'm gonna wait. This isn't what I want right now. And we want you to be ready before you ask us to come into your home and start caring for you. Um, most referrals to hospice are made by the patient's physician. And that's who we hear from first. And then from there, we get in touch with the family. Um, most referrals to the palliative care teams occur in the hospital. And we get many um, um, referrals through the hospital team when people are being discharged home. Referrals can occur 24 seven. And like I said, a family can request an informational visit in the hospital. We can come into the hospital to meet with you or at home. I'm also gonna talk about palliative care today which is um, different from hospice, hospice in the way it's been set up in our country. Palliate, I like to think of it that um, palliative care is for those who are pursuing curative treatment. Hospice is for those who are pursuing comfort treatment. So palliative care is for, um, designed for those with, uh, who are chronically ill, um, a lot of cancer patients who are undergoing treatment uh, are um, go with a palliative care team and a lot of oncology services have a palliative care doctor on their service. And this doctor is working with them for um, symptoms. And it's just like any other consultative service, you need to have an order for a doctor for it. And the difference from hospice care is that um, these patients have chronic illness and they're still receiving aggressive treatment or they want to pursue um, maybe physical therapy or occupational therapy. And um, until that is over with, then if they need to, they can get onto hospice. It isn't a substitute for hospice care. In fact, we like to think of it as a continu continuum in your healthcare. And this is what we look at as a healthcare continuum. Of course, um, curative care. And once um, palliative care is concurrent with curative care, and once that the person has determined that they no longer want to pursue aggressive treatment, then they would go on to hospice. And then the next phase would be bereavement for the family.
Um, this, this is a short video that I found that helps to explain how you appear. You are a bridge. It's true, or at least it's a good analogy. When you're healthy, when the bridge is sound, you can handle anything. Cars, trucks, trains, all the bumps of life, no problem, you are set. But if you're facing a serious health issue, something like kidney disease, lung disease, or cancer, the bridge starts to falter, cracks appear, and pretty soon it's hard to withstand all that traffic. Traffic that includes your own medical treatment. And that's where palliative care comes in. Palliative care is a specialized form of medical care, specifically designed for people with serious illnesses. Its main goal is to improve your quality of life by providing relief from the symptoms, pain, and stress that are an inevitable byproduct of both the disease and the medical intervention. In short, palliative care provides support for your bridge. And when a bridge is in trouble, there is nothing better. Now, palliative care, just like construction, is a team effort. It takes doctors, nurses, social workers, and other specialists, all working together with your physician to realize that extra layer, the layer that can make all the difference. It's a treatment method that makes sense at any stage of life and at any stage of an illness, because it's never too late to lessen the burden. So, next time someone you care about is facing a serious illness, remember this bridge analogy and be sure to consider the enormous potential of palliative care. One of the reasons why I like the, um, the short video is um, the analogy of the bridge. And um, what I see our palliative care nurse practitioner doing is she's truly bridging. She's between all kinds of people, um, especially people um, who have a um, complicated illness or have com you know, several uh, chronic conditions at the same time. So she could be um, calling the oncologist, talking to them, about what's happening. She could be calling the cardiologist and she's putting the big picture together. Whereas sometimes people get so frustrated because they're like, you know, one person doesn't know what the other person knows. And it's very frustrating um, to have them talking, you know, in, in, you know, at different, with different purposes. So that is such a fantastic thing with palliative care is to have one person who is talking to everyone and who can explain to you everything that's happening and put it together in one picture. Um, this next video that I'm going to show is, um, uh, can be applied to both hospice and palliative care. I'll show it first and I'll talk a little bit about it afterwards. Hi. We got the call that this house is on fire. How can we be helpful? Well, the house is on fire, but I'm worried if you go in there it might send the wrong message. Wait, what? I'm with the fire department. Yes, I know. I think you could be really helpful, but I think the family might be worried something is wrong if the fire department shows up at their house. But something is wrong. Their house is on fire. Do you think there's any way you could talk to them? but not use the word fire? What? I just think if the family hears the word fire, they might lose hope. But I am with the fire department and I am here to help this family with their fire. Right, right, totally. I think you could be really helpful, but I'm just not sure this family is in a place where they're ready to meet the fire department right now. Can we call you the water support team? So one of the things that I haven't talked about is um, the fact that it, um, it takes real art to talk to people about bad news, about a diagnosis, and about what's going to happen. We, um, we train for this. There are theories out there. There are programs out there that help us to talk to people 
about these issues. And we have to be like the firefighter and we have to break through that barrier of people not wanting to hear what's happening. And sometimes it, it, it takes five times before somebody really hears because it, it's not easy to hear bad news about yourself or your loved one. And so I just loved this little video because we, we get this all the time. Um, you know, often we will um, have a daughter or a son say, please don't identify yourself as hospice. Um, we respect that. Um, and we, we don't make a big deal out of it, but we do um, tell the family that if the patient asks us, we're not going to lie, we can't, but we will try to respect the wishes of the daughter or the son or who the spouse as much as possible. And so they understand that if you know the patient directly asks us about what's going on, that, that we will tell them, but that we will also let the spouse or the daughter or son know what's going on. Hey, Cindy, um, Brittany here. Um, I, we have one question for you so far. Um, okay. is, is palliative care like hospice covered by insurance? Oh, that's a great question. And I'm sorry, I, I should put that in my presentation. Um, palliative care is covered under insurance, just like if you went to a cardiologist or a pulmonologist or an orthopedic, um, they're a consultative, consultative service. So um, that would be covered under um, Medicare B if you have Medicare. And if you have um, uh, just regular insurance, it's covered under that also, just like any other consultation would be covered. Thanks. That's the only question we have so far. Okay. So I'm ending up my, um, my presentation to you. And um, I would like to use the words that um, were said many years ago by who we love to think of as our founder of the hospice movement, Jane Cicely Saunders. And she said, you matter because you are you and you matter to the end of your life. We will do all we can, not only to help you die peacefully, but also to live until you die. And you need to have fun too. Thank you so much, Cindy. Um, so Bridget and Brittany will take a look and see if there are any more questions. Um, and in the meantime, I wanted to just let everybody know and remind you that we will be sharing the slide deck with you. Um, and the final two slides, let's see. Oh, I'm sorry, Jennifer. Do you want me to put that up? <laughs> I did that. Yeah, one. would you? We'll just give everybody a visual on the final two slides. Okay. Um, they they relate back to library resources. Yes. Um, and I just want to let you know that those um, the library does have book lists, so uh, reading lists. So if, if, if this topic interests you further and you want to um, learn more independently, um, these are the resources um, related to Cindy's presentation. The second page of resources has to do with reading lists and um, a database with um, that these can be useful for end of life um, related issues um, and caregiver issues. Um, and yeah, we're going to open it back up to questions. Um, I see one, Cindy, from the patient family perspective, does it matter if the hospice is a nonprofit or a for-profit institution? Does it insurance pay regardless? Are there differences in services? 
right? Um, it doesn't matter if it's nonprofit or for profit, um, which is a matter of um, how the hospice is operating. So insurance and Medicare will pay for um, hospice, the hospice benefit, no matter if it's profit or nonprofit. Um, we have one other question here. Um, is there a time restriction for these services? Um, yes, there can be. Um, initially, when someone comes on to hospice, they're certified for up to six months that if um, their disease follows the natural progression, that they would die within six months. However, you, you know that we just simply do not know how long somebody's going to live. And I must tell you that sometimes when people come onto hospice, they get better because they're getting the care that they might not have been getting before. And so we do have a lot of discharges from hospice. Uh, I call them graduates um, because they no longer meet the criteria. However, after six months, for instance, I'll just give an example because it's easy to understand. If you have cancer, your cancer usually doesn't go away, especially if, you, if you've been put onto hospice. But you could live longer than six months. We could, we've had people on our hospice team for up to three years, um, but they're still eligible because for instance, they still have the cancer, it hasn't gone away. So um, it really is a very individual situation based on the person's diagnosis and what's going on with them. Cindy, we have another one. Is there a different alternative for a person that with allergies to painkiller, including morphine? Yes, there are many alternatives that we use in hospice to morphine. And we have that many times. Thank you. And here's another one. Um, Someone asked, can hospice can be invoked and then used again later? Yes, it can be used um, as many times um, as needed. So for instance, if somebody came on to hospice and um, maybe um, had Alzheimer's, but got better during the six months and was discharged, two years later, if they started to have end, end, um, end of life symptoms related to that Alzheimer's, they could come back onto hospice. Okay, Cindy, um, does hospice provide pet related services, for instance, either bringing in therapy animals or helping patients with their pets? Oh, okay. So we do have um, a lot of hospices have um, volunteers with therapy animals who will visit patients and family members, um, but we don't, we don't uh, take care of the pets. And when I say that, we don't um, um, deal with uh, pets who are dying. And another question, how would a person select a hospice or palliative care provider? Um, well, your palliative care provider is usually associated um, with a, a hospitalization because often that's what prompts a palliative care referral. Um, so your physician, whoever is referring you is going to suggest to you um, who you should be seeing. For instance, um, if you did, if you were newly diagnosed with cancer, like I said, a lot of oncology departments, uh, services have their own palliative care physician on the service. And also um, most hospitals in this country have a palliative care team. So you would see a palliative care physician or nurse practitioner or social worker while you're in the hospital um, depending on what your circumstances are and your diagnosis is. Um, palliative care in the community is not as widespread. So most people are seeing palliative care um, providers while they're hospitalized. Now, 
And in terms of um, figuring out how, you know, which hospice to go with, um, you can Google hospice in your area and find out a list of all the hospices who are providing services. And there's also a hospice compare website, which is uh, monitored by CMS, which is put together by CMS. And it, it has um, quality measurements associated with each hospice in the country. And you can compare um, you know, hospices to one another and see what the measurements are as compared to the other hospices. have another one. If a family member contacts hospice first, what does the initial interaction look like and what should caregivers expect? Um, if the family contacts the hospice first, often a conversation will be had on the phone about what the needs are for the, the person that they're calling about. And um, the hospice will kind of walk them through the process and um, answer questions. And if that person wants to meet with somebody from the hospice, um, you know, in person or have a Zoom meeting, like a lot of us are doing, um, that can be set up too. Because a lot of times families, like we'll hear from a child um, and they'll want their siblings to be involved in an initial conversation about hospice. Uh, before they go to their mom or their dad so that they have some idea of what it's all about and they can pave the way and have that conversation with their, their mother or their father or their spouse um, as to what hospice is. But a lot of times, um, you know, we really depend on the physician to have that initial conversation with the family because we want that conversation to come from somebody that they know and trust. We're, you know, at the beginning, we're strangers and we do get to know them. And we do, we hope that there's a trust that's built between our team and them. But it really helps when it comes from the physician who the family knows and trusts. Thanks, Cindy. Um, one more question over here. Uh, can palliative care provide uh, care management remotely for multiple appointments? Is there a charge for such management for a chronically ill patient who has many at home and offsite appointments? Yeah. yeah, it really depends on which palliative care service that you're going with in terms of what is charged. Um, Medicare B uh, will reimburse physician and nurse practitioners and social workers um, for their visits. And that can be a Zoom visit or an in-person visit, um, but it doesn't cover everything associated with what, you know, what a visit is. I mean, you know, you could, uh, I'll just give you an example. You know, a palliative care physician could meet with someone for an hour and then spend three hours doing all the homework of, you know, looking through the medical charts, calling the other physicians, uh, talking with the team, the palliative care team about, you know, what's going on with this patient and then having a social worker maybe meet with the family. So there's a lot more involved than just a visit. And so palliative care um, costs are all over the place in this country. And, um, a lot of large medical services like uh, insurance services like Kaiser, they have their own palliative care team. Um, and um, which, is, which is paid for uh, through the, the insurance. But you may be, um, you know, you may be at home and you may um, want a, a, a community palliative care provider to come into your home. And it really will depend on what they have set up in terms of charging you. Thank you. Should caregivers expect to get any training on medical devices being used at home with the patient? Definitely. Um, the, the vendors that we have contracts with um, for medical equipment will do the initial teaching because that's part of their contract. You know, they can't just come in and set down a an oxygen 
concentrator and say, well, here it is. Um, they have to start that teaching right then and there. And then the nurses um, who come into the home reinforce the teaching and also, um, you know, as time goes on, we'll answer questions about the need for the oxygen, how it works, and um, also problem solve anything that might happen. I'm not sure we have any more questions. Um, you still have an opportunity if anything occurs to anybody attending, if you've got any other questions, you can um, share them here. Cindy, if people have questions that occur to them later, is there a good way to reach you through us or directly to you? They can reach out to me at any time, um, our 24 hour number at Goodland House Palliative Care and Hospice is 703-578-7108. And um, my email is ccarney at goodwinhouse.org. Thank you. 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 Thank you